When winter once and truly breaks, and spring seems ripe to warm the woodlands, all the plants and trees yet slumber, cautious, none too quick to awaken. For here, in the north country, cold nights may yet bite hard, and the forests and breaks of the highlands can find themselves in an instant in an icy mist, or upon the break of dawn, a frost hard enough to crack the bones. And so as we look out upon the wooded vista from the heights of eagles and ravens, we see every sugar maple still sleeps, and even the stalwart spruce seem loath to reveal their colors. And in this time of spring, here in the highlands, in one moment spring might seem well and truly set, yet overnight a blizzard can fall, calling all the land fiercely back to winter's slumber. This is the trickster time of the year, when the weather is fickle and knows no bounds, when summer pushes listlessly against winter's loath retreat. Yet it is enough to summon the rebirth of life, and delicate rosettes of greater mullein, no bigger than the palm of my hand, break the high country soil where it is hard and dry, and in the shadowed woodlands, delicate bryophytes brave the cold, and upon the rocky breaks in between, the melting of bright white snow reveals stretches of snow-white caribou moss, a fruticose lichen that is edible, if one knows the secret of its preparation, and in the hidden places, the undisturbed places, ephemeral spring beauties, also called fairy spuds, lend a moment's grace, for they live but a month per year. But of all the intrepid springtime visitors, to grace this fickle land with color, the early bright blossoms of Coltsfoot must be the queens. They are among the first sources of nectar and pollen, and are important to the survival of wild bees. And in times of old, they were medicine and a delightful tea. Coltsfoot develops across the growing season in two distinct phases, and the early or springtime phase of Coltsfoot is so different from its latter season growth that without familiarity with both forms of Coltsfoot, it is difficult to recognize they are the same plant. Here is springtime Coltsfoot. It appears as patterned reddish shoots, which then develop into golden many-petaled blossoms that are clearly parts of the Asteraceae family. The shoot phase of its early stage growth might easily cause coltsfoot to be confused with young horsetails. To identify, note that young coltsfoot emerges from clusters. The shoots are distinctly reddish brown and appear to be covered in large overlapping scales. The lower scales are structures called scale leaves and the upper scales are the points in which the blossoms will emerge. The bright yellow blossoms are so lovely at this time of the year when the forest and landscape is often pale and occasionally visited by heavy frost and snows, that they are like little promises of summer and sunshine. Unfortunately, the coltsfoot blossoms can easily be confused with other small asteraceae plants, such as dandelions, which emerge only a little later in the year, around here, typically almost immediately after the coltsfoot blossoms vanish, as well as cat's ear, another asteraceae sometimes known as false dandelion or flatweed, that emerges around the middle of summer after dandelions have vanished. And very similar to dandelions, when the colt's foots fade away, they will leave fluff balls, each tuft of fluff, a parachute that will carry a seed upon the late spring breezes in hopes of finding a new home where a new colt's foot plant might germinate. And in this way too, colt's foot blossoms might be confused for much friendlier dandelions. But there are several ways by which one can quickly tell that a colt's foot blossom is not a dandelion blossom. As we have already noted, Coltsfoot blossoms emerge from shoots that appear as reddish-brown finger-like structures that shoot up from the earth and seem to have large scales over their bodies as well as their crowns. Another way is that, whereas dandelions are creatures of late spring and early summer, coltsfoot blossoms take advantage of the lack of competition at the very first appearance of spring. They are one of the first blossoms to emerge at this time of year. And finally, notably, coltsfoot loves water. The plant can tolerate a wide variety of surfaces and easily withstand dry conditions, at least for a while, but it grows most happily around and even within streams where occasionally rains cause the streams to rise well above the top of the plant. But generally, coltsfoot likes to have its roots or its feet wet. In other words, it likes to grow near someplace wet. In rural areas, coltsfoot especially likes to grow in places of full to partial sunlight along stream banks and alongside old dirt roads, where it happily grows in and around drainage ditches and channels to either side. Coltsfoot is highly versatile in terms of the ground that it will tolerate as well, and will make do without complaint with hard-packed ground or loose, rich, and friable soil.
As the blossoms fade, petioles develop from the root base and spread out, making the plant look distinctly different from its immature state. From the reddish-brown petioles, the colors of the shoots, broad, flat leaves will grow, and the palmate leaves often become coarsely serrated as they age and woven with heavy veins of a pale greenish-white. This latter season form of colt's foot is typically easily distinguished from other plants, and in particular is rarely confused with other plants of the Asteraceae family. Note again how in all these photos water is nearby. Water is not strictly necessary for the growth of colt's foot, but it does prefer having water right nearby. Though from time to time I have seen colt's foot growing far from water on hard, high and dry ground. Colt's foot is used among herbalists and in traditional medicine. The medical science is dubious about the usage of colt's foot for medicinal purposes. The plant contains hepatotoxins which, in significant or regular dosages, represent a danger to one's liver. However, its mucilaginous interior, mixed into honey, is excellent for a cough, and used only occasionally as harmless. The blossoms are especially nice in spring as they make a pleasant fragrant tea. Simply pick some blossoms, remove the petals from the green part, and drop the petals into hot water to steep. If using colt's foot blossoms for tea, they should be harvested sparingly, because they are an important pollen and nectar source for bees and other insects. Many books on foraging report that the leaves can be eaten, and they can be, though one should be cautious and if this plant is used for foraging, eaten only sparingly, due to the presence of the hepatotoxins. Young tender leaves are best. One other very interesting and seldom talked about use for colt's foot is that the plant is a salt sponge. And if one dries and burns the entire plant into a fine ash, the ash can often be used as a salt substitute. If there was salt in the ground that could be absorbed, Colt's foot will have a distinct and natural salty taste. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.